Good evening, viewers. Welcome to Climate Youth News at COP. We bring you news from the 27th World Climate Change Conference in Egypt and provide you with the most important information of the day, the latest developments and voices from the field. We start with the first contribution on the topic of the day. Hi everyone, my name is Meza Abubakar, a young environmental activist from Tanzania. It's been a while now since we have had a lot of solutions concerning the climate change crisis. From waste management, green entrepreneurship and participation of the private sector. But all this can be done without the participation of the youth. As a young generation, it is my greatest desire to see a full and real participation of the youth on this movement. You are not supposed only to be invited to the panel just to hear what the policy makers and political leaders discuss and push their agendas. Instead, we must really share our thoughts and we need to be heard with the community on what we're thinking, what we want, and we need to be a part of decisions on climate change. And this must be from the grassroots to the upper levels. During the COP27, I'd like to see the world leaders negotiate on giving the youth the high priority on this movement of climate change fighting. We are the one who will be asked by the future generation about the destruction of the world that is happening right now. We are the one who are responsible to take this beautiful world to the next generation. In fact, we are not ready to tell our future children stories on how we were a part of destructing this world. We are not ready for that. So what is supposed to be done is to let the youth to be the part of this negotiation on what we want on the climate change fighting and to decide by ourselves like what we can do to protect this beautiful world just for us and the future generation. We don't need to be used by political leaders to push their agenda through our shadows. No. It is my hope that on adopting the Paris Agreement, the youth will be on the front line and will be given high priority on the climate change crisis because the world needs us because we are the generation. After this brief overview, we can now dive deeper into the COP. The following article is on what happened today. Yesterday, we heard the long-awaited speech of Brazil's new president Lula da Silva. He spoke to a cheering crowd on saving the Amazon rainforest, which is an ally in the combat against climate change. There will be no climate security if the Amazon isn't protected, he said. This was big news, and some described Lula's visit to COP27 as a restoration of Brazil's climate credibility. The closer the deadline, the more secretive the negotiations get. Observers report a weird day at COP, as negotiations are happening behind closed doors and are difficult to follow. It appears certain that COP will go in overtime. Final decisions are expected by late Saturday evening. Concerning the cover decision to be signed at the end of the conference, right now there is a critical danger of backsliding from previous language and commitments made in the Glasgow climate deal. The current drafts fail to call for a phase out of fossil fuels and includes many references to clean technologies instead. News from the loss and damage negotiations. In good news, Parties found agreement and operationalizing the Santiago network. The network is to provide technical assistance to countries suffering loss and damage. As parties from the Global South have demanded, the institution will be overseen by an advisory board with representative of indigenous people, women and youth. 
Lian van Damme from CIEL says the decision is a compromise but sets out of path for rights-based responses, with its clear reference to human rights. The negotiations around loss and damage finance are still seeing two opposing blocks, G77 plus China and developed countries. According to Down to Earth, there are five central disagreements. Should there be a new finance facility or just a new process as an outcome of COP? Should the new financing facility be within or outside the UNFCCC? Should historical liability and compensation be explicitly excluded? Should there be a financing mechanism or a broad comprehensive approach? And should insufficient mitigation be referenced in the loss and damage decision? This current disagreement is blocking alliances for an overall ambitious outcome at this COP, observer state. Pressure rises for the developed countries like France, Sweden and the US to stop blocking a founding mechanism for loss and damage. Too little, too slow. That is the central finding of the latest adaption gap report by the United Nations Environment Programme. The same could also be said about the adaption negotiations here at COP. A key outcome of COP26 was the agreement to establish a global goal on adaption. However, little progress has been made after a draft text on a global goal went from technical dialogues to the parties to the Paris Agreement. Negotiations about a suitable framework are ongoing. Furthermore, relating to adaption, the EU announced a new 1 billion euro fund to support African countries in their adaption efforts. Out of this fund, 16 million euro will be committed to loss and damage. However, countries such as Egypt and Grenada show disappointment, criticizing the fund's limited means. 60 million? That is nothing, and there was not an announcement, says Jerry Enno, a member of Grenada's COP delegation. Regarding the new mitigation work program, the text is still in brackets and parties have to agree on timeframes, modalities and scope of the program. We will see which ambition will be formalized by Saturday. Equally, negotiations around carbon markets on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement remain controversial and very complex. However, quite some advancements have been made. Article 6 of the Paris Agreement provides market mechanism for cooperation between states to jointly achieve the climate goals by trading carbon certificates. For your better understanding, here is one concrete example of mitigation in the form of forest protection via carbon credits. Belize, a country of which 60% are covered by tropical rainforests, announced that it will sell carbon credits to countries that cannot meet their mitigation goals for its forests, which are worth up to $100 million or 5.6 million tons of carbon. Belize wants to use the money which is gained by selling these carbon credits for local communities and as a form of compensation for forest protection. However, the concept of carbon markets has been criticized to rainforest post-colonial power imbalances, greenwashing and not contribute to climate justice. Moreover, such projects to stop deforestation under REDD Plus are also controversial. They are difficult to announce for and have bad human rights records. Still, Egypt has proposed to include a reference to REDD Plus onto the cover decision. As the exact working of these carbon markets is still not clear, a supervisory body was formed last year. Its recommendations were finalized early just before COP, giving civil society no chance to comment on the draft. The suggestion also fails to establish strong safeguards for the protection of human rights and the environment. Further, it opens the door widely for carbon projects that do not yet stand on a sound scientific basis, such as geoengineering of the oceans. We'll be very curious about the final outcome of the negotiations and if we will understand them. 
in the bigger picture, there's one very sad fact we want to put to your attention. Out of 110 world leaders in a family photo at this year's COP27 climate summit, just seven were women. This is outrageous and unacceptable, especially considering that girls and women bear the main burden of climate impacts. Clearly, gender needs to be mainstreamed in every aspect of negotiations. Finally, civil society took over the stage at COP27 at People's Plenary. They raise collective demands for system change, no, not climate change, and demand climate justice. It was a very emotional moment at COP with powerful speeches. and I speak on behalf of Kang International, a network with over 1,900 members in over 150 countries across the world. As Kang International, we endorse this declaration. We do so because our people are suffering across the world. We do so because their suffering and their vulnerability to climate change is caused by the structural inequalities and injustices of economic and political systems. We do so because we recognize that it is only through decolonizing our economies and societies that we can achieve real and lasting justice. We do so because we stand in defense of the 1.5 degree guard rail, beyond which will be a death warrant for the millions of vulnerable people across the world. We do so because we believe as peoples, we need to stand in solidarity to build a future of peace and justice. We do so because we believe it is only through the power of people that we can build a better world for all. We do so because we are unstoppable. No climate justice. No climate justice without human rights. We are not yet defeated and we will never 
be defeated. The shared declaration of all observer constituents at COP closed with a strong statement for human rights. We, the people, declare for all the world to hear that there can be no climate justice without human rights. Our fight is for the very future of humanity and a livable planet. It's a life and death fight. We refuse to allow the peoples of the global south to be sacrificed. With one voice, we call for the immediate release of Allah Abdel Fattah and all other prisoners of conscience. We are not yet defeated and we will never be defeated. Climate Youth News stands in solidarity. Climate justice, people power, free them all. You see, that's really something else when you hear something like this directly from the ground. We want to continue with this and pass the microphone on to activists on the ground. I am Wenina Kuruma from Sierra Leone, West Africa. Um, by profession, I'm an activist and also um, I work on climate related issues in my country, Sierra Leone. And I'm the founder of a youth led organization called Green Union in Sierra Leone. So at Green Union, what we do, we are a youth led organization that um, addresses the problem of um, climate related issues within, using three parameters. Um, one which has to do with um, the problem of a gap in education, because we do believe um, gap in education or gap in the understanding of the climate crisis itself is a major problem um, for us to tackle the entire um, issue about climate change. Because um, when people are being informed around most of these things, um, we do believe um, you will be able to change the narrative or the mindset of the people around. And there is something around the, 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 the scenario about um, public denial because mostly people will go into denial that the climate crisis is something that of course just because of um, it's a natural stuff it's an occurrence from God not a man-made stuff so but with more understanding and more information around these things you will find out like the entire perception and the entire mindset around an individual would change and there is, we work with schools because um, with regards to the capacity building, we work with schools because we do believe schools, with schools, we could be able to create ambassadors of change. And there is power in education itself. So schools are our major targets and we also work with communities. But our main target is to work with schools also. We are actually working with schools. And within the school, we are not just working with high schools, but we work with kids starting from classes three and above, because um, research has already proven that curiosity in every child starts within the ages of eight and above. You know, like when a child is around the ages of eight, he's very much curious about everything that happens around them. Like if you have a kid, the kid will say, okay, mom, what's, what's that? If you have a watch, okay, what's the use of this watch? Why is it designed like this? You know, the curiosity, they want to know everything around them. So with that, um, with you engaging most of these kids around the environmental stuff at this particular age, you would be able to tackle and change their mindset around. And for example, if they are at home or amongst their colleagues, you tell them, okay, now, you should not throw a trash at this particular angle. Then he or she goes back home and sees um, maybe a friend throwing a trash at the particular location. He will say, oh, one of my teacher or one of my um, ambassador of change in my school told me you should not throw it there. Then you go into debate, debate, debate. Then they will start asking some of their colleagues or even people that are much more older than them around most of these things. So this is why we work on capacity building and we feel this is one of the best approach we could also use. Because I do believe in the power of human capabilities in whatsoever we do. And also I do believe um, that for every development or every change we want to start, it starts with people. So people are at the center of everything we want to do. So we start with the capacity building. Then secondly, um, the problem is around um, a livelihood associated problem. You know, um, for us in Africa, you can't imagine we have over 50% of people living in rural settings. And when we say rural setting, we are talking about deprivation. And when we talk about deprivation, we talk about deprivation in terms of information 
We talk about deprivation in terms of opportunities. We talk about deprivation in terms of development and trends in information and innovations. So um, when you think about all of this, we, we target most of these communities that are rural in addressing um, a livelihood-focused innovation stuff. It's not just about us providing support, but skills. We do believe you can also agree, agree, uh, agree with me that we have countries, like for example, guys also um, in developed countries make money from certain skills, like when you talk about web designs, you're talking about the, the Microsoft and all other stuff, designs like Internet of Things and all other stuff. These are some of the new innovations we talk about. And we want to make sure we encourage communities, we push them to some of these designs and new innovations, and even helping them with some other skills that will be very much beneficial in changing their entire perception around not just engaging into charcoal burning, because charcoal burning is being engaged by most of our rural um, dwellers in our country, timber logging, like people do more of timber logging for survival. And also, people are also highly engaged into agriculture, not just to massive agriculture, but agriculture that is not sustainable to the environment. So if we want to um, address most of these things, it's about bringing new innovations into livelihood. It's about addressing, um, changing the narrative around the livelihood perception, not just like leaving them, like, for example, we have climate smart agricultural practice in our country. It's been practiced, definitely. But, they, um, but every now and then we see, still feel some of the effects of most of these things. It's not just about us having most of these things, but also how are we pushing the people? Like, capacity, I mean, building their capacities in other areas, uh, making them um, become aware about new innovations and new areas around, and also making them to explore more opportunities. Like for me, I'm an explorer, I've explored a lot. I, I use my internet to explore a lot of opportunities. So it's about me pushing most of these dreams and these innovations also into communities that are highly considered to be vulnerable and, and also considered to be highly, highly affected by climate and environmental crisis. Then also the next problem here is about plastic waste. We talk about plastic waste. It's also a, um, it's something we can say it's very it's affecting communities because for developing countries we are having most demands. We want to compete like we want to be match up with developed countries, but we are not actually having the capacity to match up with um, these developed countries. So we, we we intend to import most of plastic materials. We intend to have most of these um, um, plastic things in our country, but how are we managing most of these things? We lack the management, like we lack waste cans, we lack also how we can recycle. So we have this team in our organization which we call the reuse, recycle and reduce. We reuse, most, we, we teach people how to reuse most of this plastic waste. Like for example, I purchase the plastic, I'm using it, okay, we can say, okay, let's design something from it, which you can also locate in your very nice colorful designs. Then we also um, engage most of the industries around like engagement on how they could re reduce most of these things. Then the recycling, it's about how we could um, recycle our plastic materials. We have a guy in our team currently, I have a guy who knows how to um, arrange the plastic waste. He can transform it into plastic bricks, but um, the tools for us to actually um, do this manufacturing is actually it's very difficult and challenging. Like for us, um, in our organization, we are just starting up. For example, I started this entire dream from my undergraduates. I had to save my money during my university days and I did some voluntary stuff which I had to save just to start up. So the entire stuff there is self-funded and being pushed by myself. But I'm very much happy that I'm here in this cup and also I'm very much happy that I do believe uh, after the COP, I could do more and even much more better. I'm hopeful that we could work together and we have the solutions on our, in our own hands, but it's about us implementing. So um, listen to some debates around climate finance, it's very much good because uh, with finance, finance is not just um, something we, we consider as something for us to do implementation, but it's a driving force for us to implement most of these things. Because with finance, you can be able to implement. With finance, you can also like there are, there are actually solutions around which could be very much beneficiary and i do believe collectively if we work collectively with communities and even rural communities we do believe 
um, that every human being has one key potential in there. If we can bring one key potential from every human being or every community person, then definitely we are making progress and definitely we can, we can impact society. But for my country, it's so sad. I was here also. On the very first day, I heard a lot of um, stories around um, communities that have been affected, like a video script was shown. But um, nothing for my country was actually shown. Like, let me be very clear, in 20, this year, 2022, we, are in, we have been affected massively by climate change. As of now, back home, farmers are still, we still experience rains in our country as of now. Yeah. The heat wave is very much high, you know. And when you think about flood, we experienced flood on the 28th of August this year, 2022. Um, communities, especially within the capital and all other parts in my country, like few communities, we are highly challenged by floods and mudslide, which highly led to um, loss of properties and all other stuff. But our stories, it's uh, like it takes us to the um, to the question of our stories really being shared to the world. No. Like our stories are not being shared, you know. So it's about bringing us, bringing our stories to the world and making them realize like this is happening back home, and we really need to work together because like the team is together for implementation, but together for implementation, are we really working together? So it's about us leaving this conference with one key thing and mantra like if not now when, and if not us who. So it's about us, it's about you, it's about everyone in planet Earth. And together we can implement. Thank you. Thank you for this powerful and important perspective. We, as the Global North, bear the main responsibility for the climate crisis and should finally live up to it. That was our today's broadcast from the 27th World Climate Change Conference in Egypt. We hope you will take something away with you. Tune in again tomorrow when it's Climate Youth News at COP27.